Get a Book Dot today presents Jack's Full of Aces, Book 5 in the Starships at War series, by Shane Lachlan Black. Copyright 2020. Stand by for a priority message from Skywatch Command. The Starships universe kicks off with Starships at War, my five novel series featuring the adventures of Captain Jason Hunter and the Bandit Jacks. Starship Expeditionary Fleet is the seven novella sequel story of the Battleship Argent and the build-up to the Second Praetorian Interstellar War. Destroy All Starships is series number three when the Human Core Alliance of Worlds and the Dragons of the Starn Star Empire launch thousands of warships into a devastating conflict that will decide the future of the galaxy. Sixteen titles and more on the way. We're making it all available in ebooks, print books, and our all new audiobooks. No DRM, no apps, no compatibility issues, instant delivery, hours and hours of entertainment, car, home, gym, at the beach, anywhere, anytime, any device that can play audio can play my audiobooks, and nobody can beat my prices. All you have to do is remember one web address, shane.lachlan.black. That will take you to the Get a Book title of the day, where all our best deals can be found. It's continuously updated, so bookmark and visit often. All ahead, battle speed. Chapter 1 you seem unusually concerned about that noise. Commander Jace Hunter stood with her arms folded. The look on her face told the prisoner she was likely in no mood for games. The look on the prisoner's face was that of a man realizing he was rapidly running out of time. Why don't you tell us what it is? The man's eyes darted back and forth as if he expected something to burst into the room at any moment. The incinerated remains of the Alaska base on Hallow's Moon were not much comfort. If someone or something wanted in... What was left of the reinforced Skywatch operations facility wasn't likely to offer much resistance. Jace didn't have to look at the medical scanner in her belt pack. She knew the man's pulse was easily pushing 170. Behind the commander's prisoner stood Lieutenant Commander Rebecca Islington, captain of the Starship Minstrel. Her hand rested on her holstered TK-12 sidearm. She wasn't expecting to have to use it, considering the prisoner was rather heavily restrained. But like all the captains from the Perseus task force, she had learned to avoid unnecessary risks. Jace was tired of waiting. This man had already infiltrated a Skywatch destroyer by impersonating one of its bridge officers. Hunter didn't know how or why he was able to utilize such an effective disguise for as long as he had, but she was also fortunate enough to employ a number of highly trained and observant officers, including the head of her flagship's mobile security detail. There were three things Jace knew about this prisoner. One was obvious. He was working for Colonel Atwell. Two, there was a very high likelihood he knew the whereabouts of Lieutenant Rhea Cooper, Ray Flynn's tactical officer. Hunter was about to test the third. She stepped around the burned control console in the dim light of the operations bay and grabbed a metal chair. She set it down and took a seat, leaning forward to make certain the man paid attention. I think there's something underground on this moon that has you terribly worried, mister. And I think if we just left you here, it might find its way in here so you can get reacquainted with it. The man swallowed, desperately trying to overcome the dehydration and the rapid half-breaths. He closed his eyes tightly as if trying to block out a sound only he could hear. His feet were arched up on his toes, and the muscles in his arms were strained and trembling. Jace cocked her head, leaning down to try and make eye contact. How close am I? You wouldn't let that happen. Even Skywatch has rules. His words sounded as if he needed every ounce of willpower to utter them. The ranking officer on the scene makes the rules, Rebecca said in a deadpan tone. Both she and Jace were dressed in black on black officer's gear. Short of full sets of assault armor, they looked about as intimidating as two officers could. The commander and I are departing Hallow's Moon in two minutes. Whether or not you depart Hallow's Moon with us is another matter, Hunter said. I know what's happening underground here. We've been after Atwell for some time. We know all about the Seethe, and you and I both know it's coming this way. Finally, as if something just snapped, the man's attempts to fight the strain subsided. 
It was as if he had passed out, but his eyes stared, pupils dilated. His mouth hung open. You can't leave me here. You can't understand what they do. It's like drowning in solitude. Hunter's visage darkened. We know exactly what they do, and we know exactly why you and Atwell and whomever else is in on this little operation of yours are so obsessed with making contact. Jace leaned closer. You tried to kill my brother. You murdered a flag officer. You almost killed four of my starship commanders and left a fifth in a coma. Now I'm going to give you thirty seconds to tell me what I want to know, or so help me, I will make certain nobody ever learns what became of you. The man looked back at Islington. It was clear he would get no sympathy from her either. The crews were taken to Jenner's star. Jace felt a twinge of anticipation. Perhaps now they would finally get some answers. Go on. Something about living tissue. It wouldn't work with the conduction fields. The ships could pass, but the crews couldn't. When we sent the freighter through, the ship arrived on the other side, but it was twisted and fused. Fused? Pieces of the ship interpenetrated with the bodies of the crew. They merged in the same physical space when the dampeners malfunctioned. We couldn't predict the power surges. Jace closed her eyes and silently mouthed a curse. The rest were transported to some other place. What other place? There's no way to know. The wormholes collapsed moments after they disrupted the fields. We were trying to avoid what happened to the Dunkirk. None of the technicians had any idea what would happen. Hunter and Rebecca both recognized some of the details of the prisoner's story. The two officers shared a glance. So Atwell evacuated the crews and put them in stasis. We sent ship after ship through on automated Navicomp settings. Most never came back. We have no idea what happened on the other side. The ships that did come back were altered on an atomic level. They were transported to the stasis field under the base. Only one ship survived intact. Orca. The man nodded. Atwell realized it was the only vessel that could survive the stresses of the inversion. Where? The man hesitated. Jace leaned forward, using the last of her intimidation tactics to push the prisoner for just one more answer. Where? Dante's twins. The inversion caused some kind of anomaly in its structure. The only explanation Atwell could get out of the scientist we abducted from Core 5 was that Orca was attuned to I this space. It can't exist in our space, at least not normally. It will twist reality until it crosses over again, and her crew will end up where no human mind can survive. What the hell are you saying? The man's whisper was as cold and lifeless as his face. Their very beings will be taken from their bodies, and their minds will drift forever in eternal darkness. Jace desperately wanted to take out her anger and frustration on this man. Atwell had already cost so many lives, and now he was telling stories about more of her fellow officers and crew in danger. The prisoner moved so quickly Rebecca was almost caught off guard. Jace was shoved back. The man whirled. Islington drew as he lunged. She fired a single shot. The prisoner abruptly pitched back and landed hard on his shoulders. His feet clattered against the metal deck. Hunter got back to her feet and went to his side. The wound in his chest sizzled. His dead eyes stared at the scorched ceiling. Rebecca holstered her TK-12. Son of a bitch, Hunter said. I can't believe these people would experiment with technology nobody understands. I can't believe they would experiment on human beings. We've got to find Orca, Commander. It's the key to this whole mystery. If we find out what's going on aboard that ship, maybe we can come up with a way to stop it. You think there's enough time to save the crews at Jenner's Star? We're going to save them and Lieutenant Rhea Cooper. Chapter 2 The privateer frigate Jester prowled the edge of the Prairie Grove 2 interdiction zone like a hungry cougar. Captain Holland Dutch McGee's squadron was deployed around the planet in their standard ambush formation, with cloaks enabled and weapons hot. McGee's formation was among the more unpredictable in the service of the Corps Alliance, as they were the captains and crews least likely to follow Skywatch doctrine or protocol. Dutch McGee was not a man given to respecting the status quo, and he definitely didn't pay attention to regulations. He would also need a magician to get past most merchant authority checkpoints. The cargo bays of the Jester were carrying enough contraband to buy her crew 200 years at hard labor, and that was just the stuff humans could enjoy. Assault Squadron 808's flagship was a study in flourish. 
Her bridge looked like a truck carrying a traveling swap meet had overturned in the center ring of a circus finale. It was illuminated by at least one honest-to-goodness oil lamp and was home to a spider monkey with a habit of lighting its own haba cigarettes with a flint disc and a piece of Maserite. McGee's crew dressed like extras from a Broadway musical about 17th-century highway bandits. Those that were human had been altered at the captain's expense to provide enhanced abilities. The navigator had a bionic implant that occupied most of the right side of his skull and gave him an enormous variety of unique optical talents. The jester's pilot was a dwarf girl of perhaps 20 years of age who was so accomplished at the controls of the 808th flagship that McGee had ordered the pilot station customized to accommodate her height and reach. It had cost him nearly two million proximan crowns to modify the ship's navigational and control systems to match, but according to the captain, it was worth it. The things his disavowed former Skywatch warrant officer could do at the helm were frequently subjects of songs spontaneously composed and performed by the crew. The jester had one other stylish feature. Her entire bridge was constructed of polished rosewood. McGee fancied himself an artist of sorts. He carried a sharp sword at his side and he penned poetry by hand. He had been known on occasion to compose lyrical apologies for his crimes. His speech before sentencing after a particularly contentious trial for bootlegging turned ten years' imprisonment into a suspended sentence. His arrest was ordered an hour later after it was discovered he had stolen the judge's briefcase and supply of illegal narcotics. After a brief and highly entertaining chase, the authorities arrived to find Holland and the jester had escaped. An automated police robot was found at the scene, turning in circles trying to take itself into custody. McGee was most famous for offering his condolences on the death of a young man on his wedding day. It seemed the newly married groom was quite taken with his gorgeous bride. He was filled with hubris and imagined invincibility as young men often are. All the attention he was getting didn't help. After one drink too many, he challenged Dutch on the grounds the captain's invitation to dance offered to one of the female guests was ungentlemanly. Despite Holland's attempts to pass it off with a laugh, the new groom would not be appeased. The young man drew a weapon and was swiftly dispatched by the captain. Holland left a flower and a handwritten apology tucked into the groom's tuxedo for the pretty young widow. After all, Dutch wasn't about to risk getting a reputation for being rude. He was feared, however, for being cunning and a deadly opponent in deep space. Few experienced starship commanders were inclined to engage the 808th straight up. Far better to offer a truce and buy their way out of trouble. Holland's eight ships were all ostensibly frigate-class vessels, but only heaven knew what surprises they had hidden in sleeve and boot. They maneuvered like a fighter squadron with ten times the punch and twenty times the resilience— McGee was the only human being in recorded history to have been formally pardoned three times and by three different presidents, no less. He was not the least bit interested in legitimacy or honor. He exercised authority under the core alliance equivalent of a letter of mark. His ships formed a quasi-military unit, and Holland had limited authority under deep space rules of capture to engage any vessel found to be violating alliance space, including civilian hulls. His charter hovered somewhere between regular fleet and the space equivalent of the Coast Guard, and Captain McGee was a master of using his knowledge of arcane regulations to his advantage. His attachment to the Hunters dated back to his numerous attempts to seduce Jason's twin sister. During a brief and flashy affair that was simply too intense to last, the two young starship officers fell for each other and then promptly separated. Jace turned out to be a more than adequate challenge for the fugitive captain. Holland became fast friends with Jason after the then-Lieutenant Hunter vouched for McGee after the privateer was fraudulently accused of piracy. The leader of the intergalactic screwballs was not an honorable man by any stretch, but Jason Hunter was like a brother. In fact, Holland planned to make that arrangement formal one day. In the meantime, Dutch was a stone-hearted mercenary, and at the moment he knew there was a gold-plated payday pinned to the scanner contact designated Whiskey India 5. Its crew claimed to have information on the whereabouts of a missing Skywatch bridge officer, and it had launched a thermonuclear contact mine at the Destroyer Constellation while escaping from Gatern space. The captain would collect handsomely for taking her a prize. The missing starship was either down or in some kind of concealed orbit over Prairie Grove 2, and at the moment, the magnificent men of Privateer Squadron 808 had it surrounded. Chapter 3 Major 
Master Chief Petty Officer Duncan Buckmaster was traditionally assigned to fleet duties, but at the moment, Argent's Marines and 14th Infantry's troops were working as a more or less combined service. Darya Komanov was also working a little outside her normal rounds. She was an intelligence chief normally in command of covert operatives working in places where weapons fire meant everything had gone to hell and it was time to abort and escape. Now, weapons fire was a signal her side was winning. The problem was she couldn't get a clear idea exactly what she was supposed to be fighting, and her ground base's tactical section wasn't helping much at the moment. What's the word? Both of our remote reactors are still online. Commander Curtis tells me operations are nominal. Absent some kind of catastrophe, they should provide us with stable power reserves indefinitely. That's some good news for a change. Zoni Tixia strode into the Garrison Operations Center. High-gain antennas are back online. We should have full-spectrum communications across all Skywatch-controlled territory. Commander Flynn reports all of our birds have achieved stable orbits at latitudes 6 through 8, and we have space superiority over Bayon 3 for the time being. Tactical, give me a unit-level status of the battle space. Komanov took a sip of tea as the 40-foot-wide reactive display covering the long wall of the operations center shifted to a top-down view of the southeast region of Bayon 3's largest continent. Starhaven and the 14th Infantry Garrison were situated roughly in the center of the map, with the decommissioned Lethe Deep's planetary defense base at its upper edge. Not far from the garrison were the two temporary reactor sites established by Yili Curtis and her combat engineering team. The Skywatch forces were gathered around the garrison. The technical term to describe their strategic situation was surrounded. Opinion, Master Chief. It's oblivet. Komanov smiled. A couple of the younger technicians looked confused. Mr. Leach? The biggest threat on that map are the forces to the southwest. You mean the heavies to the southeast, don't you, sir? Buckmaster replied. Explain, Komanov said. These are skirmish forces dressed up to look like regular infantry, Leach offered. The Seacrop's siege units are regular main armor, but I think they are a diversion. Whoever planned this little operation apparently knew we would be working with inferior numbers and firepower. They knew we would have to make a choice where to break out along that line, and they are banking on us hitting the heavies first. Interesting theory, Komanov replied. You're advocating a feint and then hitting one of those three battalion-sized formations with overwhelming force, hoping the heavier units can't take advantage of the time lag to get to the garrison before our forces can recover and meet them head on? It only works if we can get Commander Flynn to thread the needle. Leach highlighted the starship constellation, which was no longer in orbit over the garrison. Komanov and Commander Flynn had both wisely deduced the Sarn ground units would be in range to engage the orbiting destroyer unless Flynn broke orbit and maneuvered his ship into deep space. I see where you're going, Lieutenant, and I like your style, the Master Chief said, leaning back and folding his stout arms with a satisfied grin. If Captain Hunter had accomplished nothing else, he had staffed his ship with some hotshot young officers and given them a mark to match. Leech looked pleased. It was a rare honor to get a public compliment from the chief of the battleship, even if technically he outranked the man. It was no secret Buckmaster was practically guaranteed to be at least 20, and in some cases more like 25 years older than any other member of Argent's crew, whether they were officers or enlisted. Duncan was literally the old man of the ship. There were Marines and fleet aboard Argent who had never seen six service stripes on a uniform before, and more than a few junior officers had made the inevitable mistake of saluting the Master Chief on the occasions he was required to wear his Class A and ribbons. The crew had taken to calling the mistaken salutes and the embarrassment and apologies that followed brass seizures, until Colonel Moody overheard the term and brought the practice to an abrupt halt. Were his chevrons replaced, the Master Chief's decorations could easily have been found on an admiral's coat. His three purple hearts inspired stark disbelief in nearly everyone who didn't know Buckmaster's service record. A kind word from the Master Chief was second only to a compliment from the captain himself. I propose Constellation approach Zone 2 from this position, 15 degrees uprange from the target location. Once there, she can establish a powered geosync orbit and be in range to acquire targets while simultaneously being over the horizon and untargetable by the direct fire weapons from Zone 3 southeast of Starhaven. Outstanding, Komanov said. Orbital fire support to soften up their formations. We hit the forward line with gunships and medium armor and then drop the 12th mechanized on their flank. 
Zone 2's firepower will be tied up dealing with us, leaving our orbital platforms free to target anything in range. With respect, ma'am, doesn't that leave the heavy forces in Zone 3 with a clear shot straight through the Starhaven perimeter and into our defenses? The technician was white-faced, expecting to be vaporized where he sat. The look on his face was one of pure youthful courage. He obviously believed it had to be said. You're forgetting something, Private, the Master Chief said. The young man looked at Buckmaster. We have 85 fighters and a whole lot of pilots with nothing to do. The Master Chief's grin was so wide the young Marine private couldn't help but smile. Get this to Captain Tarkas, Kamanov said. I want 6th Armor at J-Point in 15 minutes. The private slipped his headset back on. I, ma'am, coding your message. The Master Chief took a break from the activity in the command center and followed the corridors to the garrison crew quarters. One of the bays had been set aside for Admiral Hughes and was even labeled as such. A battalion Marine was still stationed at his door per Commander Hunter's orders. Even though she had important duties elsewhere, she wanted the Admiral well cared for and protected. Private. Aye, Master Chief. The Marine stepped aside. Buckmaster knocked. Come. The Master Chief stepped inside. Admiral Hughes was dressed in a Skywatch t-shirt and service trousers. He looked fit and alert, which was always good to see, considering what the man had apparently been through at Gitarn. Master Chief, come on in. Great to see you. What have you added to the reading list while I was away? Red Badge of Courage. Hughes smiled as he looked over his glasses. Reading takes my mind off being surrounded by guns and explosives so other people with guns and explosives can't harm me. Appropriate, Buckmaster replied as he took a seat. Sir, I've noticed something unusual, and I want to get your opinion on it. By all means. The Master Chief produced a handheld and called up the Skywatch personnel files for the Admiral. He handed the device to the older man. You are still listed as missing in action. Makes sense. Nobody outside of our little club knows I'm alive, at least not yet. The commander would probably agree this gives us some interesting advantages, sir, Buckmaster said. Your command codes haven't been deactivated yet. The members of the commander's special forces recon unit are all technically suspended. The closer we get to home, the less authority we have. So I'm the only guy who can open the ice cream shop? That's affirmative, sir. Buckmaster took the handheld and began configuring it to transmit an encrypted directive. Now we certainly don't want to send up a signal flare here, but there is one thing you can do with those command codes that will definitely give us some important options when the excrement hits the rotating air circulation device. Chapter 4. Jack 2 and Jack 5 flew in a precision 1-2 follow formation, emerging from the Orestes jump gate precisely four hours after exiting the Bion system. They were navigating on their own authority as Skywatch officers. Technically, they had no orders or official destination, but from a practical standpoint, Either Anora Doverly or Lucas Moody were of sufficient rank to write destination orders and encode the necessary checkpoint passes. As long as they didn't start doing dangerous stunts in the space lanes, they were largely immune from interference by civilian authorities. Orbital Guard and the Auxiliary had a handful of ways to at least delay fleet units, but it was rare to find anyone aboard an ORG boat with a command rank. Such officers were rare enough to be permanently assigned to ground stations or space lane control decks on civilian planetary receiving yards. The last thing Commander Doverly had done before being ordered off the Starship Argent was to dump all of the ship's SRS data to a portable storage device. She snagged Commander Islington's tactical officer and used Komanov's powerful garrison computers to sift through it. It didn't take long before she had a 4x6 emissions and ECM signature on the Starship Shrike. As the lead fighter for the semi-official mission, she was not only following a hunch, but also following what the navigational computer aboard her fighter insisted was a residual trail matching the data on Captain Cerulea Lorleans' flagship. So what you're telling me is you don't think the Condor pirates are up to something? You think our captain is up to something? Moo asked over the directional comlink. We know Jason, and we know this is the kind of thing he would come up with and not tell us. But he lets us in on all of his plans. Not since he got promoted and ordered to take command of Argent Moo, he's been very cagey about telling us the whole story. I think he figured it was time for some misdirection. The battle over Bayon 3 was lost. Our attack force had to ditch on the surface. Our command and control was shot out of space by rifle cutters. Even if we wanted to, it would have taken Zoni two hours to reestablish the data link, 
and by that time we would have been carved up in orbit. You never got over that ace of spades trick. That's our Jason. That's exactly what he would try to do. Take himself out to confuse the enemy, let the music play, see where the fight goes. Getting Lorleon involved just makes it easier for him to keep his crew out of it and keep us out of danger. Sure, we're always in danger. Well then, keep us out of unnecessary danger. Who authorized 7-0 on the flight deck? 7-0? The fighter he flew out there. No weapons. A half-configured transponder. The damn thing wasn't close to flight ready. Someone would have had to manually disengage the deck launch safety systems to even get that thing into a rail tunnel. Buckmaster? He could, but he doesn't have clearance to disengage the flight safety systems. Those are all computer-controlled and require a senior officer. And no, it wasn't Sabrina. I asked. And it wasn't one of us. That son of a bitch. He unlocked his own bank safe. Jack-2 rocketed across the Core-2 perimeter with Moo's fighter right alongside. And the course we're following only makes sense if he was working with Lorleon in advance. Why the hell would a wanted fugitive allow herself to be pinged by Argent's SRS banks well within range of our point defense right before the captain's flying paint locker explodes into a cloud of debris and then fly directly into core space with a deliberate ECM signature for us to follow? How far behind are we? A day, perhaps a little more. Moo pulled up his own Navicomp readout. The projected course he and Honora were following was as clear as a bell. Gale River. What the hell is at Gale River? The ships that just got wrecked at Bayonne. And one other commander. A ship of your acquaintance. Honora pulled up the LRS passives for the shipyard. Right in the center of the carnage was the undamaged hull of the heavy missile cruiser Saratoga. What the hell are you up to, Jason? She muttered. Chapter 5 uh The first thing the colonel noticed was that the pain in his hand was gone. The ache had been there in his bones ever since the accident that claimed the nerves in his fourth and fifth fingers. He opened his hand and closed it again into a strong fist. It was exhilarating. It made him feel alive. No longer was he weakened by a lack of dexterity. Even his vision was sharper. The colors in the rocky charred ground were a wonder to behold. The clash of radioactive particles made the minerals in the cold lava-like surface sparkle gently. You've achieved a heightened state, sir. It's difficult to explain, but suffice to say your mind and brain have adapted to a frequency that makes it possible for you to project your essence to this place. Where is the facility? We are only a mile from the complex. The obelisk is bearing 239. Sure enough, the ominous shape of the alien structure was just close enough to be visible in the noxious mist that rose over the dark side of the planet's surface. During the day, visibility was excellent unless there was a weather event. Raleo 2 was now infamous for its radioactive ammonia lightning storms. The ionization was enough to disrupt even beamed communications using secured and reinforced high-power microwave transmitters. Colonel Zachariah Atwell looked at his feet and body. He was dressed in what appeared to be a standard utility tunic and leggings. It was a clean uniform similar to what technicians might wear aboard Skywatch ships. His was gray with cobalt blue sleeves and legs indicating a life support or environmental controls rating. At the same time, the colonel could tell he wasn't all there. His body felt weightless, even though he moved as if he were on the surface of a planet with comparable Terran gravity. The procedure necessary to get his mind to cooperate with the quasi-illusory experience of existing in a place distant from his body was both complicated and obscure. The colonel had already been forced to send almost half of his technical team away to put a stop to the arguments over whether the equipment they had found represented a breakthrough in organic telepathy or a mechanical means of breaching the dimensional barriers between what some of the colonel's scientists called matter frequencies. Two of his best researchers had already paid the ultimate price for their knowledge. One was driven mad by the complete loss of his mental identity. He was brutally killed after putting three trained combat specialists in the hospital and permanently crippling a fourth. The second experimented on himself with the alien mind mechanism. A power surge transported part of his being to some other plane of existence, leaving behind only an afterimage of his body, which experienced unimaginable torment as it faded into nothingness over the course of several minutes. One of the witnesses to that incident killed nine more people when they attempted to flee through a pressure door into the open atmosphere to escape the screaming. The resulting implosion almost destroyed the facility. 
After weeks of study and careful experimentation, Dr. Han's team finally discovered how to reach the human mind with the machines. They built enormous couches in which the subjects were restrained so their heads would not move. As it turned out, it was the involuntary muscle spasms common to humans that caused the mechanisms to scar the minds of the victims and cause immense physiological damage. If these brains were able to handle the twisting of the mental effects, humans could not. Your mind is providing the self-projection. You are seeing what you expect to see, even though your biological body is still in the experimental section of the forward base. Doctor, you may yet turn these secrets to our side. I tend to doubt that, Colonel, Dr. Han replied. It took us almost a year just to figure out how to connect these devices to the proper power supplies. It may take several lifetimes to make heads or tails of what we've discovered since. The chamber of glyphs under the obelisk is a fine example. My assistant estimates there is enough information encoded on the walls and floors to fill several hundred volumes. So far, our best language experts have deciphered perhaps two or three percent of it, even with the assistance of our lexical and optical analysis equipment. Atwell examined the sky. The star arrangement looked similar to what he had seen before from the Raleo 2 surface. That was his first confirmation he was not out for an evening stroll. Had he been standing in his body at the location his senses told him he currently occupied, he would have been burned alive by radiation and suffocated by a lack of breathable air. Either would have ended his life in moments. It was what he saw around what his mind projected was his current location that caught his attention. To someone unfamiliar with the Ithis, they resembled pools of crystal clear water. Inside each one was an object roughly the size of a tangerine giving off light in varying intensities and colors. As the light refracted through the water, images became visible. Some of Atwell's technicians had been recording the images for analysis for weeks. What have you discovered? There are over a thousand of these pools, Colonel. Each one acts as a multidimensional vision of events apparently occurring elsewhere. Some of them have so many different sequences of playback happening, it is difficult even for our computers to interpret them in any intelligible way. We've found that depending on where you stand and at what angle you view the light sources at the center of each pool, you see different imagery. Some is even visible in different light wavelengths. The liquid is not water, even though to our minds it looks very much like what we would expect in a shallow tide pool. It is a very complex organic molecule that is much heavier than the compounds familiar to our science, but it is not based on carbon. We believe they are polyatomic molecules, but they are made up of elements that are not familiar to us. Astonishing. It was yet another facet of the technology the colonel had deployed hundreds of people to study. His avarice had become a near obsession. He had to control it. He had to find a way to harness it. Interference with his work simply could not be permitted. He placed his ghostly fingers in one of the pools. They reacted with the surface tension and caused ripples to form. The light shifted subtly and the images changed yet again. He was looking at a planet with a triple sun. Its surface was molten metal. Although Atwell was certain he was looking at billions of tons of incredibly hot minerals on the verge of boiling away, the slow methodical waves looked so peaceful. It was as if the metal tides were part of a universe-spanning clock ticking so slowly no human would ever hear it strike the hour. I could stand here, Doctor, and witness all creation. I have the kind of vantage point every man dreams about, yet none have ever known. Atwell rose, looking out over the hundreds of pools, each with a glowing stone submerged in it. What is this technology? How is all this possible? What are they using to communicate? How can a simple stone do this? We read no mechanisms here. There are no electronics or power sources to speak of out here on the surface. And yet behold all this. It is beyond our science. Nothing is beyond our science, Doctor. If it exists, it must have a rational explanation. It only takes study and an open mind to unlock its secrets. Colonel, if I try to explain fluid dynamics to a five-year-old, they will never understand it. Their failure has nothing to do with their intelligence, nor does it have to do with the effectiveness of my teaching methods. It is simply beyond their ability, much like professional sports are beyond the physical capabilities of most high school students. It is only human arrogance that persuades us to believe we can master all knowledge. Clearly, there are some things in this universe and on this very planet we simply cannot understand. We can study them and perhaps learn more about their nature. But to harness technology created by a species with a 10 billion year head start is absurd. 
Careful, doctor. There are some in the scientific community who consider such viewpoints heresy. It was only a few hundred years ago our species was still living in filth because we were unable to build and maintain adequate water and sewage systems, Han replied. We had leaders who believed there were higher priorities than avoiding disease and famine caused by humanity's inability to properly dispose of excrement. We fought those battles for a thousand years before we could even begin to reach beyond our atmosphere. To these beings, we are a bacterial infection at best with a similar capacity for understanding. The men who impede us and who forbid us from our work here are exactly the kind of people you describe, Atwell said. They beat their beasts and plow horses and shout, Dig deeper, dig faster, instead of allowing someone to create a shovel. One wonders how many died to make agriculture possible in the face of the tyrant who insisted more gatherers were the answer to prosperity. Indeed, Han said, dipping his own fingers into one of the pools. One of the greatest epiphanies of your ancient Earth history was the discovery that academic performance was being held back by a lack of breakfast. Atwell grinned. Don't tell me you've been reading those old propaganda rags again. Is that what you do for recreation? I studied the subject on my own, Han replied. Humanity's leaders could not understand why their students were so rebellious and intransigent when it came to learning. It never occurred to them their parents were rushing them out of the house in the morning to avoid what they called traffic. Their children sometimes went 12 to 15 hours with barely any food when the overnight interval was taken into account. It was no surprise their brains were impatient and unwilling to perform energy-intensive tasks like concentrating on linear algebra and Mesopotamian history. They were sitting there in their seats, starving. Naturally, every classroom had rules against eating, because what better path to academic excellence than to fill a room with people who haven't eaten in half a day and then criticize and blame them for not being interested in hours of lectures? Atwell looked over at his chief researcher. That really got to you? Humanity's failures of centuries past? It is sobering to consider just how wrong people can be while they convince themselves they are nearly perfect. I can't say I disagree, Atwell replied. How much further could humanity have reached were those men subdued and the illegitimate power wrested from their grasping hands? We mustn't let ourselves be dissuaded, Doctor. We must not be distracted. There is a connection here. What these creatures have wrought on this planet and beneath the defense base must be examined and understood, even if it takes us billions of years in equal measure. Humanity's destiny is to wield this power, to take up the tools of the gods and hammer the universe back into the paradise it once was. Dr. Han watched as Colonel Atwell wandered off, picking his way past the shining pools, repeating his ambitions as if they were a mantra. I will lead us back to paradise, 